location, the pulse of Iowa City. The College of Education at the University of Iowa spotlights educational trends and innovations. Ever-changing, ever-present, and exciting. For a front row look at education today, join us at Meeting Place, a weekly program presented by the College of Education from the University of Iowa's Lindquist Center. Thank you for joining us at Meeting Place. I'm John Hafner, your host. There's a lot of disagreement about how to improve the quality of education in the United States. But there's also agreement, at least on one point, I think. When all is said and done, it's the quality of the individual teacher in the classroom that is of primary importance. Yet there are a lot of charges being made about the preparation of teachers. They say, for example, that students don't want to go into teaching anymore and that we aren't enlisting or recruiting the best and the brightest, and that the teacher education program itself is inadequate because it's all education courses and no academic content. Well, Meeting Place can't examine all those charges either in depth or in general, but we can take a look at the educational experiences and program of students who want to qualify to teach. So today's meeting place is going to examine the University of Iowa's teacher education program to prepare teachers in a field where there certainly is a shortage, mathematics. And we have an excellent crew to help do it. Retta Breckenridge is a major, is a senior at the University of Iowa, majoring in mathematics and completing her work for a teaching certificate. Glendon Bloom is assistant professor of mathematics education in our College of Education. It's great to have both of you on the program today. Glenn, let's start with you. Uh, for a student who comes to the university and thinks that he or she might want to go into teaching, how does the process begin here? It typically starts with an advising conference with a faculty member in the College of Education. At that time, I check on the student's progress toward the general education requirements that are required for all liberal arts students. I explain required mathematics courses and describe the education courses that are offered in our program. Quite often, I spend as much time in that conference uh, trying to get to know the student as I do explaining course requirements. Um, I encourage my advisees to examine their reasons for wanting to become a teacher and explain some opportunities that they might have during the time they're in our program to do other uh, teaching related experiences like tutoring while they're in our program. Um, we discuss the sacrifices and rewards of being a teacher and I try to determine whether the student has a genuine interest in working with young people. That of course is essential to anyone who wants to be a teacher. Retta, uh, you were one of his advisees at one time anyway. When and why did you decide you wanted to teach math? Well I decided in high school and I know that seems early but my family and the community in which I lived placed a great emphasis on mathematics and science. And so in high school, when it came a time for me to choose electives, I chose to continue mm -hmm. with my math. And that emphasis got me to take the courses, and then my own enjoyment that I received from those courses helped me to continue that. And I decided to do that in college also. With the introduction of the printing press in the 15th century, education for the masses began to take shape. It took nearly 400 years for the textbook to become the foundation of education in Western Europe and the United States. Some were fearful of this new tool of learning, and this slowed the widespread progress of instruction. During the 18th and 19th centuries, 
education for the masses became less abstract and less formal. With the entrance of the machine age, many realized that people needed new types of training for specialized jobs. Education again began to change direction. Evolving slowly were ideas in using new types of instructional aids. One of the earliest visual devices, the magic lantern, was to help usher in a new era of projected images to instruction. In the late 1880s, audiences were entertained with dim images on a wall, lit by a magic lantern burning whale oil. The projectionists were likened to magicians as they performed unbelievable feats of lifelike imagery. Many pioneers experimented with these new inventions. Most early inventors probably never realized they were laying the foundation for instructional technology. The impact of their efforts on the mainstream of education, however, went unnoticed for many years. Still, it was only a matter of time before educators understood what these pioneers had stumbled upon. Although instructional films had made great strides up to the 1930s, their real potential was not recognized by the general public until another decade had passed. With improvements, educational media was to be rediscovered with the start of World War II. Training films had been used by the armed forces during the First World War, but World War II proved educational films were effective and worth the time and money. Many thought wartime training films were a totally new tool which had great potential for post-war education. But in reality, military training films were successful because of techniques known to many filmmakers years before. As thousands watched the war at home on newsreels, soldiers were being trained with a variety of instructional films. And you still have the, uh, the videotape uh, machinery uh, being used as well, only now it's being married with the computer and it now allows such things as interactive instruction and allows us to talk about such devices as video discs and video interactive types of learning. So that covers, in a nutshell, what has happened in terms of our development from the hardware machine point of view. I'll show you how to do an author search. You touch the author, and again, you're touching the word that would be alphabetically ahead of what you really want. And it, it breaks it down and narrows it down as you look for it. And by moving my cursor on the screen, I can draw, make lines, points, anything I choose. Anytime I wish to go back to the main menu, I can just push a button. If I want to make a box, I choose the box option, press the button, select where I want my box to begin on the screen, and lock that position in. To create this effect, I was manipulating the uh, chroma keyer. Uh, with this particular video switcher, we can create a variety of effects by going up to the Mix Effects 1 bank and bringing down the toggle, we can create a box. And now, if I use the positioner control, I can position this effect anywhere I'd like to in the scene. And you can move that on both X and Y axis. This program is one in a series on the operation of commonly used audiovisual equipment. The 16 millimeter sound projector is a device that uses a light source 
and an optical sound track system to project moving images and sound from 16 millimeter film. The operation and features of 16 millimeter sound projectors vary greatly. The threading procedures for 16 millimeter projectors fall into three categories, manual load, automatic load, and slot load. The projector used in this tape is a manual loading machine. Once you have mastered this type of manual threading, you should have no difficulty with either auto or slot loaders. To operate the 16 millimeter sound projector, unlatch the cover locks, tilt the cover away from the projector, and lift the cover off. This cover also functions as the projector's speaker. Release the speaker cable from inside the speaker to connect the plug to the speaker jack. Uncoil enough cable to position the speaker as close to the screen as possible. The speaker should be placed at the ear level of the audience for optimum sound distribution. Next, lift the supply reel arm up as far as it will go. Lift the take-up reel arm until the take-up belt can be put on the take-up pulley, and then lower the arm so that the belt is taut. Remove the power cord from its storage compartment and plug into an AC outlet. Turn on the projector power switch. Turn the motor and lamp on by moving the master control all the way forward. To make a projected image smaller, move the projector closer to the screen. To enlarge the image, move the projector away from the screen. Magnolia trees down south, they may get 100 feet across their bonnet. They have big white flowers this big, huge white flowers. And when they bloom, a forest of magnolia trees, it smells so good. That is, unless you hate the smell of magnolias. My God, the magnolia trees are in bloom again. Yeah. You know, but I love the smell of magnolias, and I know how to set up a romantic tune, right? A tune called Magnolia, I'm Coming Home. Right now I feel like a cold north wind Blowing down across the prairie on the breath of gin I'm looking for a lady with honey in her mouth I'm looking for a woman I know down south Magnolia I'm coming home Oh, Magnolia I'm coming home Well, I'm going down the Mississippi from Minnesota. The northern lights are shining in my eyes. I'm headed down south with loving on my mind. I'm looking for a lady like a honeysuckle vine. Magnolia, I'm coming home. Oh, Magnolia, I'm coming home. To where the Caribbean trade winds caress the Gulf Coast stream. A southern bell is ringing, echoing in my dreams. Right outside of Natchez, she's waiting there for me. On the banks of the Old Man River, we'll plant our family tree. Oh, Magnolia, I'm coming home. Oh, Magnolia, I'm coming home.